Oh, hey, you know, we've all heard the stories. If only my mom hadn't thrown away that baseball card set. If only I hadn't put those baseball cards in the spokes of my bike to make that whirling sound, I'd be a millionaire. My father claims that he used to have a Mickey Mantle rookie card, but he used to spend his summers with his aunt in Norristown. And when he moved away for the school year, well, his aunt didn't think those pieces of cardboard were worth anything, so she just threw them away. Yeah, only I kept my set of 1950s Bowman or 1952 tops, I'd be rich. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. On this channel, we talk about the history of baseball from the A's to the Phillies to the 19th century. And sometimes we talk about contemporary baseball issues. So if you love baseball, and if you love Philadelphia, stick around and subscribe to our channel. And that's kind of why some baseball cards are worth so much. They were just little pieces of cardboard that happened to have baseball players printed on them. And since so few people from the 1950s and 1960s hung on to their baseball cards or took care of them when they were kids, well now they're pretty rare. And it's strange because back in the 1990s, we experienced the opposite problem. Baseball cards were no longer seen as worthless pieces of cardboard. People began to get serious about things like whether there was a stain from the bubble gum that was in the wrapper. And, well, that was kind of the weird thing. Baseball cards used to be a promotional gimmick to sell gum. Even one of the leading baseball card producers was known as the Topps Gum Company. Gum was the main product. And to get you to buy more gum, well, the gum manufacturers put these baseball cards in the pack with it. In fact, if you go back to the late 19th and early 20th century, baseball cards were a way for the tobacco companies to get you to buy more cigars and cigarettes. Man, have things changed. But the 90s is when we started to see big changes with high quality printing on both sides. For the longest time, when tops dominated the market, you would have a picture of the ball player on one side, and then the back was more of a low quality printing that had his statistics, maybe a trivial fact about his career. And in the late 70s and early 80s, some of Topps' competitors, like Don Ross, and Fleer, switched to a higher quality cardstock, put their high quality picture on the front, and incorporated more colors on the back. And soon, some of the companies that were competing with Topps, they started putting pictures on both the front and the back. And if you were fortunate enough to find a rookie card in one of those packs, boy, were you lucky. Today, Mike Schmidt rookies go for tens of thousands of dollars. Mickey Mantle, almost half a million. And back in the 90s, rookie cards for players like Ken Griffey Jr. and Cal Ripken Jr. were already commanding high premium prices. So much so that I remember watching a financial news show back in the 90s, and the pundit was talking about smart investments. And when asked where could people invest their money, he broke out a pack of baseball cards and said, hey, if you're lucky enough to get a rookie in one of these packs, your investment could be worth thousands of dollars, just as long as that rookie became a superstar. And that's when the hobby took off, but for all the wrong reasons. Now, I used to love going to sports memorabilia shows, things that would happen, say, in the middle of a shopping mall, and peruse through all of the vendors to see what they had. And I could concentrate on looking for all the stars on my favorite team. Could I find a rookie card for Greg Luzinski? Yeah, I did. Could I find some nice Mike Schmidt cards? And here's a sample of my Mike Schmidt collection. Could I find some good Steve Carlton cards? 
And here are just a few of the Steve Carlton cars I've amassed over the years. But even with Schmitty and Lefty, there were limits. As a little kid from Fishtown, well, a Mike Schmidt rookie card was well out of my price range, as was the 1972 traded card for Steve Carlton. But back in the late 80s and early 90s, I went to college in Miami. And in Miami, there was a huge number of Jose Canseco fans. You know, back when he was a young player and pretty good. Before he got hit in the head with a fly ball that turned into a home run. People were paying thousands for his rookie card. But I have to admit, that craze led me to look for and then buy rookie cards of players from my favorite teams. And those teams included sports other than baseball. So I have rookie cards of Sean Bradley, Pat Combs, Tyler Green, and Eric Lindros. And I still have those cards in their hard plastic covers, which was meant to protect them from wear and tear and the ravages of time. This case that has the Tyler Green card even says rookie card on the top, which I think says a lot about the state of the hobby back in the 1990s. And now that plastic sleeve is probably worth more than the card itself. So I'd like to take this time to share with you some of my baseball card collection. I started when I was around six years old, and I used to love reading the back of the card, where not only could I learn about the player's statistics, but sometimes I could learn an interesting fact about the player or the team he played for. Topps, of course, was the big company, but Fleer and Donross were coming into their own. Fleer was known mostly for their stickers. Fleer had stickers for each team, sometimes multiple versions of the stickers for each team. And on the cardboard backing of those stickers, well, some of them were parts of a puzzle, and some of them contained interesting facts about baseball history. My cousin and I sometimes got together and shared our sticker backs to see if we could complete one of the puzzles. But that could end up in disputes as we would then argue over who owned all the puzzle pieces. And when you're six or seven, well, you're not really thinking about how you're taking care of your cards. I had several cards that wound up in my back pocket and eventually went through the wash. Poor Jim Cott, Jose Cardinal, Richie Hebner. I lost many of my 1976 and 1977 cards that way, yet somehow Barry Foote survived. And that is a shame because, in my personal opinion, I think the 1978 set was probably one of the most attractive of Topps offerings. Those protective pages that you put in three ring binders, well, they weren't really widely available when I was a kid. Instead, I would use a photo album to store my cards, and it was one of these photo albums that was made for wallet-sized pictures. You know, like the ones you would get when you took your school pictures. And the thing is, they didn't quite fit baseball cards. So I have a number of cards where I trim the edges to make sure that they fit in my photo album. Because, well, I didn't realize I was damaging the value of the card. I did that to a lot of them. Yeah, they're not worth much now. There goes my retirement nest egg. And I remember being confused because Burger King had his own set. I think it was back in 1979, 1980, 1981. And it was a special set that had only the Philadelphia Phillies. I think you got it for getting a kid's meal or something. Yeah, my family spent a lot of meals at Burger King during those summers. My parents were probably a little too indulgent to tell you the truth. The thing is, they were the same exact cards as the top set, only you could tell that the printing wasn't the same quality. Many of the pictures were just darker than the normal top set. They were also numbered differently because, well, it was the Burger King set, and the back of the card clearly had the Burger King logo. And I didn't quite understand that 
maybe I should keep my Burger King card separate from my regular top set. Well, at least at first. And I was also confused because which cards were available depended on which region of the country you lived in. And back in those days, my family used to go to Seaside Heights on the weekends during the summer. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Philadelphia or New Jersey, that's a resort town along the Jersey Shore. The summer community had this great boardwalk, amusements, spinning wheel games where you could put your quarter down and win such prizes as candy, baseball cards, those special mirrors, maybe even pieces of furniture. Oh, oh yeah, and there was a beach too. And there were a lot of people from Philadelphia who went to Seaside, but most Philadelphians went to places like Atlantic City or Wildwood or Cape May. The further north you got along the Jersey Shore, the more likely you were to run into New Yorkers. Seaside was one of those areas that got a lot of New Yorkers. And in the late 70s, most of your New Yorkers were, for obvious reasons, big Yankees fans. So when I walked into a Burger King in Seaside or Seaside Heights, I was disappointed to find that the baseball cards they offered there were Yankees cards. Although, to date, I still have a warm feeling for that great late 70s Yankees team. I can still remember players like Bucky Dent, Goose Gossage, Reggie Jackson, and Thurman Munson. And that's not something you freely admit as a Phillies fan because, well, we're supposed to hate the Yankees and how they buy their championships. But somehow, my childhood Bucky Dent didn't survive into my adulthood the way Del Unser and Keith Moreland did. And it was right around 1981 that I started to value the concept of collecting the full set of baseball cards for that year. I was about 10 then, but it's weird. 1981 was the strike season. That was the year baseball suspended its season right in the middle. This was a source of great disappointment, especially to a 10 year old kid who spent most of his summers at Veteran Stadium. Yet in that year, Topps had this set that had these great cards that memorialized the Phillies' first world championship. They had a special card for the Phillies winning the National League pennant, and then two for the Phillies winning the world championship. One that showed the entire roster on the back, and the other that showed the record for all the games on the back. You know, it took the Phils 97 years of their existence before they finally won a world championship. And we fans, well, we savored it at the time, just like Mike Schmidt told us to. I mean, who knew if we'd ever see that again? And in 1981, Topps also released its sticker album for the first time. So you would buy the stickers in packs, and you would place those stickers in the album, hoping to fill all the slots. And if you were missing some stickers, they conveniently had a way in the back of the book to order the ones that you needed. And as you can see, sadly, I didn't really take advantage of that opportunity. And with the stickers being placed in the packs randomly, by the end of the summer, you were buying as many packs as you could just to fill up those random spots here and there that you still needed. And again, this was 10 year old me, so I didn't quite get the idea that taping a sticker in when the adhesive failed would have been a bad idea. The product was attractive because of how they treated the Phillies. They were the only team that had a team photo in the book. After all, they were the reigning world champion. Mike Schmidt dominated the National League batting leaders page. And Steve Carlton, who was the reigning Cy Young Award winner, well, he dominated the NL pitching leaders page. And with the foil-backed all-star page, you had three Phillies, Mike Schmidt, Steve Carlton, and Tug McGraw. Yeah, the early 80s were a great time to be alive for a young Phillies fan. My parents, well, they looked at my buying behavior with a degree of disapproval. They'd ask me, how can you buy baseball cards and support them when they don't even want to go on the field and play ball? Well, 
And perhaps it was collecting the stickers that filled the void that season because it was one of the only seasons that I wasn't able to go to the ballpark to celebrate my summertime birthday. And I had done that a lot in the late 70s when I was growing up. And celebrating your birthday at Veterans Stadium as a kid, that was a special treat because the Phillies would give you this special birthday box. It had things in it like a tasty cake, a baseball that had stamped on it the signatures of the Phillies, and a book from the Phillies that showed you how to play baseball. The book had things like how to grip different types of pitches, how to eat healthy, tips on playing the different positions. But what made this book special was that in the middle of it, it had a fold-out section that had baseball cards of the Phillies. And oddly enough, the Phillies didn't really update their inventory from year to year. So this is the book they put in the birthday pack for several years in a row. And the cards date back to 1977. And perhaps that's why I remember such players as Richie Hebner, Jay Johnstone, and Ted Sizemore so clearly. Along with, of course, Greg Luzinski, Larry Boa, Mike Schmidt, Steve Carlton, Larry Christensen, and Tug McGraw. They had this dotted line on the back, so I would cut the cards out along the dotted line and keep them along with my normal tops collection. The nine-year-old me didn't quite understand that the cards would be more valuable if they stayed together on the same page. This is the only one of those books that survived. I did the same thing for the baseball cards that were printed on the Hostess snack cake boxes. And then of course I put a rubber band around them and put them in a shoebox that I stored under my bed. Shoe boxes were very valuable to me then. I still store some of my 1970s cards in them. And you can see I didn't destroy all of my investment. But I didn't collect baseball cards for their monetary value. Sure, my dad's story of the rookie Mickey Mantle that was long gone inspired that little mind to hope that one day these little pieces of cardboard might actually be worth something. But from time to time, well, I get reminded that these little pieces of cardboard are just taking up valuable space in the basement. I just don't get it. Because when I do go down to the basement and I crack open one of those boxes, or I open up and start looking through one of those three ring binders, I immediately get transformed back to that little nine-year-old, begging my mother for a quarter so I could run down the Girard Avenue and in one of the candy stores buy a pack of baseball cards. And as I stuck that hard piece of crumbly bubble gum in my mouth, and oh, by the way, Fleer had the better bubble gum, their bubble gum was soft and much more sweet. I would excitedly go through those baseball cards and see if I had any more Phillies so they could join the ones that were already on display in that little photo album. Or maybe I could collect doubles so I could then write to my cousin in Ephrata and offer to trade with her some of my doubles so that we could both complete our set of Phillies. By the way, as much of a Phillies fan as my cousin from Ephrata was, her father came from the St. Louis area, so he was more of a Cardinals fan, and during the early 80s, he liked to remind us of that. Still, those were simpler days. Show your hometown pride. Philadelphia baseball history merchandise. T-shirts, phone cases, masks, notebooks, mugs, and more. Check out the exclusive designs in our merch store and celebrate your favorite Philadelphia-based team. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you have any ideas for topics that we can cover in the future, please let us know in the comments below. If you would like to see more of these videos, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Again, we'll have a link in the description box below.